Hey guys, bet you didn't think that you were going to see me today, but it's Friday, so of course we have to do a book talk. So, um, I am wearing my winter coat today because we are going to go on a little trip to Siberia with this book talk. I'm going to do a book talk on As Far As My Feet Will Carry Me by Joseph M. Bauer. So it's a book that I've been reading for the past couple weeks and I just finished. It is excellent. It is a true story about a guy who was sentenced to prison in a Siberian labor camp and walked to freedom, like walked from Siberia to Germany. In case you're not sure where Siberia is, it's north of Russia. Russia's really, really cold and Siberia is north of Russia. It's like almost as cold as the North Pole there. So let me show you a little map in this handy dandy book. Okay, so okay, so here we've got Russia and we've got Siberia up here. And so this guy um, walked all the way from this labor camp all the way over here down through Russia and then through actually part of Iran and then over through Turkey and back to Germany. And it took him several years to do that. Um, but it's the true story of this, this guy who actually did that. Um, so the backstory of that is that <clears throat> this takes place right after World War II. And the guy who is the main character of this story is German. And he was in the German army during World War II. Like he was in the Nazi army. But um, if you were in the German army, bad news bear bears when the war ended because you lost. And he was then, because he was an officer in the German army, he was sentenced to life in a labor camp because he was on the losing side of the war. Um, so he was, he had been captured by the Russian army and then he was carted off to Siberia and um, actually they were going to sentence him to work in a lead mine for the rest of his life. Um, mining lead is like really dangerous. It causes you to have like brain deformities and make your teeth fall out and like die an early awful death. And he was like, yeah, that, that, I don't want to do that. Um, so he ended up escaping and walking to freedom. And there are tons of crazy adventures in here. I mean, Siberia is so cold that like at one point he accidentally fell into like a creek like and didn't even fall in that far like up to his knees and his boots froze onto him like he couldn't get his boots off until he was able to get to somewhere where he could make a fire and like thaw his boots so he could get them off of his own feet um crazy crazy stuff he comes across like indigenous siberian people and he has like a herd of reindeer for a while um, and as you can see on the front cover, he has a husky for a while. That's his pal. Um, he names him Willem. Um, so I'm going to read to you just a little bit from the beginning of the story. And um, this is when he first gets to the labor camp. So you can hear what it is like at this labor camp and why it could possibly have been a little bit difficult to escape from this place. <laughs> So this was after being shipped on a train for a really, really long time across Russia and then being on a forced march also for a really long time to get to this very remote place in Siberia. It says, After the men had been counted, they were led off in groups, each to a separate point at the base of a large conical hill. Attempts have been made to level the ground, and for most of the way they were treading on rubble. Then they came to the head of, the, of a shaft tunneled into the, the, into the hillside. Following the Russian soldier as he went through the opening, they found themselves in a passageway with a floor sloping gently downwards. As they progress, progressed, the width and height decreased until each was about six and a half feet. Soon they were in complete darkness and their guides started talking loudly to himself so they could follow. After a while, the Russian soldier stopped to light a lantern. In the dim glow, the men saw that they had reached a small cave empty except for a bare table and a stool at one side. Lighting a second lantern from the first, the Russian left one burning on the table and signed to the prisoners to follow him. At the far end of the cave, they entered another passage leading to another and much larger cave. 
Here the guard stopped and, holding up his lantern, indicated that this was to be the prisoner's home. The men gaped. Some of them had imagined that they would be housed in huts that they had seen above ground. Certainly none had been expected to be thrust into a subterranean cavern and told to live and sleep there by the light of a single flickering lamp. As far as they could see, the place was bare. No furniture, no straw, even on the rocky floor, and only the, the only means of ventilation was the passage down which they had come. There was one compensation. It was warm. Leaving the lantern with the prisoners, the guard went back up the tunnel towards the smaller cave and, putting his tommy gun on the table before him, sat down on the stool, facing inwards toward the prisoners. They realized then that the problem of guarding them had been solved in the simplest fashion. Accommodated in the bowels of the earth, close by their place of work, they had only one route to the surface, and that could be effectively blocked by one man or two men allowing for a relief. If the prisoners had been housed above ground, on the other hand, many times that number of guards would have been needed, together with all the paraphernalia of barbed wire, fences, searchlights, and watchtowers. So since they are underground, it's really, really easy to like guard them and keep them from escaping. So if you would like to know how Clemens Forel escapes from a Siberian labor camp and then walks thousands and thousands of miles to his freedom and survives, check it out. All right. Peace. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. I will see you guys next week.